Amen. So we're going to continue up here preaching uh, in our series of uh, the, the kingdom of God. Amen. And uh, today, we're all three of up here, we're up here to determine which one of us is the greatest preacher. <laughs> all right, so we're, we're going to take a vote at the end. And <laughs> Uh, no, actually, this morning, we're, we're talking about the greatest in the kingdom of God. Come on. And uh, that parable, the greatest in the kingdom that Jesus tells, or really the story that Jesus tells, uh, is in Matthew chapter 18. So if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles in Matthew 18, we're actually going to be referencing Luke chapter 9, Mark chapter 9 as well, uh, of a similar account. Mm -hmm. uh, before we do that, I do want to recap the past couple weeks. So we're in week four of our parable themes and series. And uh, we're going to transition next week and the following week into continuing the Kingdom of God series. But this is the story or parables that we're kind of covering. Last week, Clayton and I had the opportunity to speak about the wheat and the weeds, or the wheat and the tares, if you will. Uh, talking about how Satan is our enemy. Yep. Clayton covered that. Satan is our enemy. Um, and talked about, really, our, we are not the judge. Right? Jesus lays out this beautiful parable and then describes it on uh, we are not the judge, the angels will come, uh, we are the people of God, Satan has his people that he sends in, and those are the weeds, and uh, we covered that. And really, the, the theme of that is we're called to live a certain way. Amen. That's that right. is holy and godly lives. All right, so let's get into who's the greatest preacher. <laughs> Matthew chapter 18, if, in verse 1, we'll start there. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Amen. He called a little child and he had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We're going to pause right there, and Corey and Clayton are going to continue on in, in the rest of this description. But right here we see, now I don't know if you've read this story before, but I think in the past I've read this story, and I've seen it as like, oh, this is cute, <laughs> right? Jesus brings a little child up. He's going to use an illustration. This is great. But the more I read this and the more context you get, this is actually an extreme, this is a rebuke. Yeah. Okay, this is Jesus. I don't know. I see Jesus getting fiery, get a little passionate right here. This is a rebuke by Jesus, because if you read the other accounts in Mark 9 and Luke 9, the disciples were actually arguing about this. Yeah. Which one of us is going to be the greatest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus calls them out and he says, what were you arguing about on the road? Mm. And what it actually says is they were silent. Yep. They were too embarrassed to talk about what they were arguing about. And so Jesus here has a stern rebuke for what they're, going, what they're talking about. Right off the bat, Jesus rebukes the disciples really over what is selfish ambition mm -hmm. or self-exaltation. Hmm. He says, really what makes you great in the kingdom of heaven, it's not your accomplishments, no. it's not prestige, it's not status, says really what it is is a dependency like this child hmm. in great faith and dependency on God. Yeah. Sometimes we put the, the, the cart before the horse on this one. Yep. Right? We get our priorities or our, we get it all mixed up. What really matters, we get out of order. Right? Sometimes it, we even take the world's definition of greatness hmm. that... Our idea of greatness is tied up in selfish ambition, advancement, and honor of look at the things mm -hmm. I have done. Mm. Amen. And we bring this in, this worldly definition, into life as a disciple. Mm -hmm. Jesus, look at the things I've done for you. Wow. Look at how much I've changed. Look at who I've helped. Look at who I've served. Look at my status. Amen. Mm. We get this way out of whack. Yep. Now I think of, uh, even as a disciple, right? A basketball analogy, right? Here we go. 
If you don't know basketball, it's okay. Just <laughs> stick with me, right? But basketball analogy, we're standing at the three-point line, and we're just lighting up three-pointers, right? Steph Curry. All right, we're just... Does that mean making them or... Yeah, that light... Yeah, thank you. All right, let me do it. We're just Corey, Corey McClary over here, all right? We're just lighting up his kids on the court. We're, we're making every shot, three-pointer after three-pointer after three-pointer, and we're thinking so highly of ourselves. Hmm. Right. And Jesus... It's true. ...says, hey, you're shooting on the wrong goal. Mm. Mm. <laughs> wow. 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 I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen like a little kid's basketball game at some point, like some kid steals the ball and he starts running that way and everybody else is like, where are you going? Until he turns around and realizes that was the wrong way, <laughs> right? Your goal's over there. But this is what we do as Christians. We just think we're lighting it up. Mm. God's like, you're shooting on the wrong goal. Mm. We're missing the point. Come on. Wow. See, the right goal is how dependent are you upon God? Come on. Well, mm -hmm. The right goal is how much faith is yours like a child, wrapped up in a desire for Jesus. Mm. See, God here uses a child because he wants a childlike heart. Amen? Yeah. He wants, you know, even if you don't have kids, you were a child once, That's okay? Right. Yep. And a child, as a child, you are dependent on other people family, grandparent, parent, you know, caretaker, whoever it is, you are dependent on that person. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus says. I want you to have that heart of dependency. Mm. Verse 3. He says, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Let me ask you guys a question here. All right. What is, uh, why does changing, changing our thinking, changing our way of conduct even, why is that so difficult for us? Or even personally, why is that so difficult for you? Well, you know, I, I think about um, our BC days uh, before Christ. <laughs> and uh, for me personally, I was uh, baptized at the age of 27. Uh, made Jesus Lord. Uh, that was just a year ago. Amen. Um, <laughs> Looking young, bro. Yeah, thank you, bro. I appreciate that. Well, you don't age. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but I, I think about uh, my the culture that was ingrained in me, um, and I think for me that is the most challenging. Yeah. Um, is to then transform my mind, my conduct, my behavior. Right. Um, as Jesus perfects me uh, into being who he calls me to be uh, as a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then we have to deal with not only that aspect, but we have to deal with the world that we live in on a daily basis. Mm, that's right. Mm. And so that's why it's imp so important for us uh, to stay in the scriptures, uh, right. to have accountability, um, you know, brothers and sisters sharpening each other yeah. uh, so that we can uh, become who Jesus wants us to become. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I think so much about the Pharisees. You know, even after we become disciples, we can have such a pride at, at times, uh, you know, a self-righteousness like the Pharisees had. Like, I already know all this. Mm -hmm. There's really nothing more that you can show me or teach me. And right. we can tend to think the same way we've always thought about things yeah. and not realizing that, you know what? Sometimes we need to rethink things. Correct. As we go back and as we study the scriptures, Jesus brought to the Pharisees, no, let me help you understand yep. what this is yep. really about. Yeah. And true. sometimes as disciples, I know for me, I can get stuck or get set. This is what I know is right. and You can't convince me otherwise. <laughs> And it's just my own pride, not willing to see, wait a minute, maybe there is a different perspective here Amen. that we need to think about. Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. Amen. Yeah, let's look at the word. It says, unless you change or unless you convert. The word is strepho in the Greek. Unless you convert, meaning unless you turn, turn from one thing 
to another, right? Literally turning oneself. Unless you churn from a course of conduct or you change one's mind. Unless you do this, turn from your way of thinking, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. See, this is just so different, exactly what you guys are alluding to. It's just so different than what we're naturally used to. It requires an actionable item. I must do something in order to change. Mm. I can't just say it out loud and it's magical. Mm. It's an actionable item. I must turn myself away from that way of thinking. And then in verse 4, he says, Therefore, whoever humbles himself mm. like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus gives the answer to their foolish argument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he gives an answer to their prideful argument. Mm. And it's the opposite. It's humility. Yep. Well, Humility. Whoever levels himself, whoever reduces himself to plane, Metaphorically, it's whoever brings themselves into this humble condition. Hmm. See, Jesus is like, your prideful argument, you're shooting on the wrong goal. Yep. Bring yourself to a humble condition. See, sometimes a good rebuke or mm. correction mm. is what we need, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Amen. I don't know about you, but when you get rebuked, whether it be by the scriptures or a brother or sister who loves you, man, you remember it. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's, he's correcting their prideful way and bringing them to a humble condition. You see, humility and a childlike heart and dependency are what Jesus says makes us great in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Kyle, I really appreciate that reminder because um, I think for me, that's one of the prayers I have to pray <laughs> every single day yeah. uh, as a leader. Um, as one who um, played basketball in college and um, tried to be big man on campus, mm -hmm. um, at times I still can have that mentality. Sure. Um, and so to pray the prayer of, you know, God, don't let it be about me. Mm. Right. But let it be about you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Amen. And uh, I could fall into that trap so many times, so I appreciate that. Amen. You know, Jesus answers this question again, who's the greatest in Luke chapter 22, in verse 24. Come on. And it's at the Last Supper, and it's uh, amazing to me, this transition. I'll, I'll read verses uh, 24 through 27, and then we'll talk about that. It says, a dispute also arose among them, the twelve, as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. <laughs> Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercised authority over them called themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that, hmm. disciples of Jesus. You are not to be like that. Hmm. Instead, the greatest among you should be the youngest and the one who rules like those, like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Mm. It is not the one who is at the table, but I am among you, but I am among you as one who serves. Amen. Wow, I've often imagined how this transition went at the Last Supper. Hmm. Come on. When Jesus points out that there's a betrayer among the 12, and then they begin to discuss which one of them is the betrayer. And then we read in verse 24 <laughs> that this dispute arises about who is the greatest. Mm -hmm. So we go from 
who is the betrayer to who's the greatest. Mm, wow. I've always wondered, like, how did that actually go? <laughs> like, was Jesus just kind of sitting there like, <laughs> like these dudes, <laughs> right? But he talks to them about the ways of the Gentiles mm -hmm. and how they lord their authority over people. Yeah. You know, they, the Gentiles, you know, they were uh, very showy. Yeah. You know, they, they wanted people to know what they had done. It was all about self-gratification. It was all about look at me. Hmm. Yeah. And Jesus says, don't be like that. That's right. He says, the greatest in my kingdom is the one who serves. Yeah. The Greek word there is uh, diakion, diakionon. Uh, the noun is diakonos, okay? And that, that word serve is used in verse 26 and 27 three mm. times. And then Jesus brings up this question, who is greater? The one sitting at the table or the one who serves? You know, I talked about culture a few minutes ago. How would we answer that question mm. realistically? Because our society teaches us as well, just like it taught the Greeks and the people in that society, that it's the one who's sitting at the table being served. Mm. Sure. Mm. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm going to flip the roles on you. Mm -hmm. Because my kingdom is not about those getting served, but it's about the ones who do the serving. Mm. Come on. And even though he held the most supreme place, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and he's sitting at the head of the table. We see him in Philippians 2 when he says, I became nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I became a servant. Mm -hmm. And at the same dinner, he gets up and he washes the, the feet of his betrayer. Yeah. Showing them not just telling them, but showing them what a servant looks like. Mm -hmm. Washing the feet of his betrayer. The greatest in the kingdom of God, again, we got to transform our minds. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Is the one who serves. Mm. In Matthew 20, verse 28, Jesus says, The Son of Man did not come to be served. No, I'm not sitting at the table. I'm not the one who's dining, hmm. but to serve. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the waiter. <laughs> I'm the servant. And guess what? I don't need any tips. <laughs> I just want to love upon you and serve you and make sure you're taken care of. So guys, my question is, when you think about serving, what comes to mind for you? Some of the people here in our church and ministries that you may think of, what do you think about when you think about the way Jesus served and the example we see in the disciples? He talked so much about, you know, when I was hungry, mm. you didn't feed me. You know, when I needed clothes, you didn't clothe me. So thinking about those who have needs and really working to meet those needs, you know, not just praying for them, which we need to do as well, but actively trying to do something to actually help them in their situation. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got many people who are going through difficult times, and we can make a huge difference by taking the time just to go and serve them Amen. and help them. Yeah. And I've seen 
so many over the years of people that do add to me a lot of that like behind the scenes type serving, right? And we get it so mixed up sometimes. I do too. Like the serving is the people you see. Oh, I see people serving. Oh, you're doing that and you're serving on AV and you know, but it's a lot of times I, the, there's so many people that have come and go, how can we serve campus ministry? Amen. Right? We got a, family groups today that have served, served them lunch, feed them, right? But there's people that like do it behind the scenes that we don't even realize that don't want the recognition. People have asked, what do you have going? Can we come? Nobody announced it. Nobody told them to do it. Right. But their heart is just, where can I, where can I fill that role? Yeah. And the campus, they look hungry. Yeah, they're hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got to wrap it up so they can eat yeah. it. Let's... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember in campus, it's like uh, ramen noodles, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Amen. You know, I, I, I think about, um, you know, I think about the uh, brothers and sisters who serve in our CR ministry. Mm, yeah. Uh, I think about the uh, prison ministry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think about uh, the Newburn House, mm, Gina yeah. Flanders and uh, Mark Felcher and uh, so many that um, serve and uh, go over to Guatemala and are on, on their own dime. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark is getting ready to go here uh, for a whole month uh, to serve over there. And we've got brothers and sisters who are going with him uh, to serve. And um, so what, what a great uh, example. Uh, I think about the brothers and sisters who have uh, volunteered to give Maxine Lee uh, rides um, to her, her treatments mm-hmm. um, and, right. you know, being with her. Um, and making sure that uh, she's feeling loved and taken care of, and mm-hmm. so, so many others. Sure. And yeah. so, um, uh, really appreciate how our church uh, really serves in an incredible way. And uh, looking out at the Massenbergs, you know, uh, every time we have uh, something that deals with uh, the medical field um, and serving at, at, at any event, uh, they always are raising their hands mm-hmm. um, to, to help out. So. Thank you guys so much for what you do and how you use your talents to, to serve God and his people. And again, so, so many others yeah. um, really provide an incredible example. Yeah. Man, I appreciate the things you guys have shared. I mean, Kyle talking about, it's not about our status. It's not about the accomplishments that we have, but it's about us being humble and having the heart of a child and knowing that we need to be dependent upon God. You know, and Corey talking about serving. Um, so key, you know, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, Amen. you know, uh, and so as we're serving, we get blessed because of us serving, and we don't think about that at times. We think, well, I'm doing all the work. I'm doing all the work. It's just so hard for me, (laughs) but Jesus says, no, you're going to be blessed by giving, by serving, rather than just looking to receive, you know. These characteristics that we see that Jesus gives us as far as who's the greatest in the kingdom, we got to take these things in. Mm. And we got to begin to examine our own lives. Where am I on a personal level in these areas? What place do I put myself in in regards to looking at myself as being the greatest? Is it about my status? Sure. Is it about my accomplishments? Or is it about my humility? Do I serve? Mm. Do I look to see where needs are and look to meet those needs. Or I do always look to be given to, you know. The yeah. second, this last one we're gonna look at, if you go back to Matthew 18. Come on, Clayton. Let's go, Clayton. It's gonna be maybe a little bit different take on, on this that you might not even be, have ever thought about. But in Matthew, back in Matthew 18, starting in verse six, it says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Lovely. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. 
It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. We can look at this particular part of this section like, wow, Jesus, that's hard. (laughs) But I look at this in a very different way. I look at this as Jesus loving us. Loving us enough to protect us, to help us to understand what will destroy us. Yeah. That's what I love about God. And that's what I love about Jesus. They're always looking to protect us. They're always looking to love us. He could have not told us this. He could have not told us the things that would hurt us. He could have not told us the thing that would, would keep us out of heaven. Right. But he chose to let us know that. And, and to me, when I think about this section of this particular passage, I think about the word surrender. Mm. Because it takes someone who has surrendered their lives to God in order to do what he's talking about here. You know, Jesus is in this beginning here when he talked about causing one of these little ones of mine, you know, to stumble. He's not referring so much to little children in this, Mm -hmm. but he's referring to those who are young believers Mm -hmm. or who may be weak in the faith. And he's saying, if anyone causes them to stumble, right. so it would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and be thrown into the depths of the sea. He gives a warning. We give our children warnings <laughs> because we want to protect them. Not because we want to take joy away from them, because we want them to be able to have the right kind of joy. We want them to be able to have the right kind of success in life. That's why we keep them from harm and we warn them. Mm -hmm. You know, this word that he uses here, the word stumble, or in the old NIV, it says causes someone to sin. It's the word scandalon. It's actually the word where we get scandal from. That's where Mm -hmm. our word scandal comes from. And here when he talks about this millstone, just to give you a little bit of reference, we actually had an opportunity to be able to see this when we were over in Israel. You know, the millstone, it's about the size of a four-foot to six-foot diameter stone. It's big. It's not a little stone that he's talking about, but a large millstone. And what they were used for is to be able to grind grain or to press olives. And those millstones were attached to a donkey, and a donkey would walk in a circle And that one millstone, as you see in this picture here, is on top as it goes around the circle. It's crushing the grain or it's crushing the olives underneath. But this is how they would do that. And Jesus is saying, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, take one of these millstones right here. It'd be better for them to have that tied around their neck and thrown into the depths of the ocean or depths of the sea. One of the things that the Romans would do to punish people is they would actually tie a person in a sack and they would throw them into a large body of water. Jesus is saying something even stronger than that. He said, take this millstone (laughs) that's huge, tie it around their neck and throw them into a deep water. And with that millstone, you go straight to the bottom. There was no way out. There's no way up. (laughs) Again, he's helping us to understand. He's warning us about how important it is for us to watch what we do and to watch what we say Mm -hmm. and to watch how we live our life because we could cause someone to stumble. And he doesn't want us to do that. Let's keep going here. Now it gets very personal. (laughs) Your hand causes you to sin. Or your foot causes you to stumble. It says, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. You know. Mm. Before we jump into that, guys, I, I want you to think about this question as we, as we even think, about, think back to causing people to stumble. Mm-hmm. What are some things that we do 
that can cause people who are weak in the faith or who are young believers to stumble? You know, one of the things I, I think about is uh, I think about the hypocrisy among leadership. Mm. Um, I think that uh, I've seen over the years, uh, 22 years of being in the ministry, leaders who have preached powerful, inspiring sermons. Uh, but when uh, trouble comes or uh, there's an there, there's a issue in the church, uh, I've seen them not practice what they preach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, hypocrisy among uh, the leadership or, or anyone uh, in that matter, a Christian disciple, um, causes people to stumble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think of the word uh, influence. Mm -hmm. Like we don't realize, and then specifically with that, our words. Mm -hmm. Like we don't realize how much our words influence other people. Yeah. Positive or negative. Right. I mean, you have an uplifting thing to say about somebody in that person's eyes now. That person is, you know, uplifted yep. in positive light. Mm -hmm. You have a negative thing to say about somebody or something they did or the way they live or handle the situation. Now that person is always in a negative light. Mm -hmm. and I don't think we realize how influential our words just as Christians are. Yeah. It's the way we talk about, think about portray other people or situations, that influences a young Christian when their mind is forming, when their spirituality is forming, when their uh, perspective is forming about what a Christian is. And uh, we, we blurt out a lot of stuff yep. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. all too often. Yep. So. Sometimes we let our mouth get us into trouble. Yeah. Um, and we don't even realize how powerful those words can be, you know. I, I think about situations where someone may be going through something very difficult in their life, mm. and they may have challenges in their marriage or something like that, and when we go and spout those things out just to anybody, how it can affect people's faith. Right. Amen. You know, if something has happened to us in a negative way that somebody has done to us, and we begin to go share that with other people, mm. just like you were saying, Kyle, that now they have a perspective about that person right. that we've planted in their mind mm. that they didn't have before. Mm. It's and it's important for us to think, wow, my words, my actions, how yeah. am I influencing others Amen. by doing these yeah. things? Amen. Whether positively or negatively, you know. Hmm. As he talks about, again, on that personal note, the things that we need to deal with in our own life, you know, if it's causing us to sin, to cut it out, to throw it away. It takes a person who's surrendered mm. to yeah. do that, who surrendered to God, who has a state of mind and understand this is where I know where my life is. And I know the things in my life that are causing me not to be who I need to be for God. And I'm getting rid of those things. It's a person who's surrendered. You know, the word surrender means to yield something to the possession or power of another. Hmm. What does surrender, a surrendered life actually look like? What would you guys say? A surrendered life, what does it actually look like? Hmm. Am I first call again? Go for it. Yeah. Um, by the way, I like your suggestion. I love these chairs. How do you guys think about that? <laughs> it's just lovely. I'm I know it's getting off topic. <laughs> Good idea, I'm Kyle. I like them a lot. You know, <laughs> nice, nice look. Um, what was your question? Oh, what, what does a surrendered, surrendered life look like? Yeah. Squirrel. So yeah. Um, so for me, I, I imagine the church singing, and the church is singing and. And I don't know if you've ever been here, but you're singing and you got so much going on in your life. Mm. But you're singing with clutched fist. Mm. And it was, more love, more power, mm. 
And then we just started to release. Mm. Because we're giving it to God. Mm -hmm. We're offering it up to him. And that's what I think about when yeah. I think about a surrendered life. Amen. That's good. Yeah, it was similar. I was think of control. Like mm. we, we want to hold on to so much. <laughs> we want to grasp what we, we want to take control of, what we can take control of. And I think of First Peter 5, right? Like cast all of your anxieties mm -hmm. on him. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just this complete like, I, I just giving it over. And that, that's hard for us because we like to control things. Yes. Yeah. It's hard for me because I like to control things, have yeah. my hand in an influence. <laughs> it's God's yeah. casting. And I think we carry so much of that anxiety at times in our spiritual walk instead of just, God, you're in control. Yep. Amen. And that's difficult. Amen. Amen. I think about Jesus as our example in being surrendered. Hmm. Now, Hebrews chapter 5, listen to this verse. Okay, this is Jesus now, what he did. It says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, this is in verse 7, it says, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Oh. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. This is the Son of God. He's perfect. He doesn't need us to tell him anything. He is God incarnate. Yep. But look at what he did while he was here on earth. He prayed to God with loud cries and tears because he knew how much he needed God. He knew how much he needed his father. He was surrendered. He was like, I can't do this on my own. The son of God. It's saying this, yes. okay? Not one of his disciples, but the son of God. I can't, God, I need you. Mm. Mm. That's the surrendered person yeah. who knows that God, without you, I, I'm powerless. I can do nothing. And then what Jesus challenges us to do in Luke chapter 9. Look there. Hey, Amen. Come on, bro. Come on, Clayton. A verse that we're familiar with, Luke 9, here Jesus challenges us. In verse 23, it says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. It says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. See, a surrender life is someone who's, God, I'm, I, I give my life to you. Yeah. I'm losing my life for you. I'm not trying to save all this stuff. I'm not trying to save my status. I'm not trying to live off of my accomplishments, my prestige. God, I'm surrendering myself to you. Whatever it is that you desire, I am here to do what you desire. I'm not looking to keep myself safe. <laughs> yeah. I'm here for your purpose, for your use, whatever you desire. That's someone who's surrendered, who've given themselves over to God and say, you use right. me. So think about this question. Why would we not want to have a radical mindset about something that we've been told is destructive to us. Mm. Hmm. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is pride. Hmm. Uh, a lack of uh, humility. Yeah. Um, you know, the questions that we ask, uh, the biblical questions that we ask uh, when we're baptized, um, what is your good confession? Mm hmm Jesus is Lord. Lord. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but now, um, at, at times in our lives, we, we don't want him to be Lord over certain areas. Mm. Because we feel like we can uh, do it better or it's not happening fast enough for us. Uh, we, get, we get impatient. 
Uh, we want it now. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, this, this lack of humility and uh, pride and, uh, you know, taking the keys back from, from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my, my quick answer goes back to what I was talking about is the word for change, you know, strepho, mm -hmm. converting. Like the, it requires too much change mm. to do what Jesus said. Mm. And even the word you used, that radical mindset, I think the older we get as a Christian, as a disciple, we think that word is for the younger. Mm. That on. one's for the young Christian. They can be radical. <laughs> they can have all the zeal and the fire. And, but it, it's for all of us, Amen. right? It's, it's yep. change. Amen. It's continual yep. turning towards Jesus. And, um, there are things that are destructive that we need to continually turn from. Great you know, I, I think about, you know, Great there are times where we can look at someone else and say, well, that, that's going to destroy them. But we don't, we don't really believe that it'll destroy us. Mm. It ain't going to destroy me. Mm. Right. I can handle this. Yeah. I'm okay. It might destroy them, but not me. We don't really believe that it's destructive. Wow. I also think that temporary pleasure can often be more important than eternity. Mm. That's true. I want this right now. I know it's not good for me. How many times have you been on a diet and you're like, well, I know I'm not supposed to be eating this, but I'm going to have it anyway. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we do that. We already have decided that it's not good for us and we'll say that. Yesterday. <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway because we want that temporary pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> and we feel like that's, that, 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 that gratification right there, man, that's so important to me right now. But what if that was your dying moment right after you were gratified in that sinful way? Amen. Mm. Wow. And then you drop dead. Well. Mm. Would that be the way you wanted to end your life? Because you wanted that temporary pleasure. Wow. Jesus said anything that causes, we got to cut it off. We do have to have a radical mindset about it. Right. You know? Think about warning labels on things. How often do we ignore warning labels? Mm. Ah, they're they just putting that there. They just, it's no big deal. No, we just overlook it. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's what I love about God is that he loves us enough to protect us. That's right. To tell us exactly what we need to understand to keep us safe. That's right. So if we want to be great in the kingdom, Amen. don't think about status. That's right. Mm. Think about being someone who is dependent on God, mm. who's going to be humble. Think about how you can serve. Yep. Just like Jesus did. He was the son of God. He didn't look to be served. He wasn't looking for people to serve him. He was looking to serve others. And be someone who decides that you're going to surrender. You're going to surrender everything to God. Amen. That's who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. That's, right. That's who we want to be. So as we think about things, think about your life and think about where you are and make some decisions that you are gonna be the greatest in the kingdom based on what Jesus says right. and not on what the world tells us is great. Amen. Amen. You know, next Sunday, we're gonna continue talking about the kingdom of God, but we're gonna do something that's gonna be a little bit different. And you're gonna be, some of you are gonna be a part of that. Mm. We're gonna talk about Pentecost. Because that's, you know, we're gonna talk about how the kingdom was ushered in as far as the church, right. that aspect of it. So we're going to talk about Pentecost, and we're going to have some fun as we do that next Sunday. So those of you who are tuning in, tune in next Sunday. Amen. Those of you who are coming, continue to come, and we will continue our series on the kingdom of God. Don't forget, November 14th is our grand opening service, so we want to make sure we are making preparations for that and inviting people to come to that. That's right. Thank you, and uh, let's enjoy our time of fellowship together. We'll see you next Amen. Sunday.